Uh, back uh, this week, uh, Camilla is out. So if you're at Camilla's table, just fill in somebody, somebody else and um, get to know somebody else. She'll be back next week, but just not feeling good tonight. And we're happy to have Sandy back. Yay! <laughs> Welcome back. Anybody else got any thoughts? Anything? You got, either one of y'all got anything? Connie or no? Okay, well then we'll just pray and get started. God, we just thank you that your word is alive and active and that it is uh, more than enough for what we need, wherever we are, whatever is in our lives, that you meet us right there through your precious word and the power of your spirit. We just pray that you would be here to guide us and open our minds and hearts to what you have to say through this amazing book. And we trust you and lean on you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so have you ever had the feeling that something's just not right? <laughs> right? I mean, if you've ever had that thought and you kind of look at everything that's going on in the world around you or relationships or your job, you know, you just think this is not the way it's supposed to be, right? I mean, there's a emptiness kind of on the inside that just can't be feel, filled or a sorrow that kind of it just hangs over you that um, doesn't have really anything to do with anything going on in your life necessarily or an anxiety that just kind of churns a little bit underneath the surface if um, that's the way you felt and that it's just not supposed to be kind of is a banner kind of sometimes it's just kind of flashing in the corner of your eye let me tell you it, it's, it's not just you um, in fact, a long time ago, Paul told us in Romans chapter 8 that the whole creation is groaning under the weight of sin. And it's not just the created world, but we see that in verse 23, the same passage there, that it's not just the creation, but we ourselves also groan inwardly as we wait for the adoption as sons. And so... Uh, so far, we've been in the book of Hebrews, the answer to the struggle that we feel both inward and on the outside is not to abandon Christ and, and give up on our faith and uh, look for other things that give temporary relief. That's not the answer for us in our day looking for those that temporary relief would be like in technology, or relationships, material possessions, hobbies, distractions, all kinds of things. For the original recipients of this letter, they were groaning under the persecution of the Judaizers, that is, their fellow Jewish brethren, wanted them to stop leaning toward Christ and go back to the law. With the And they kind of were doing that. They were kind of going, yeah, maybe it's okay if we mix rituals and grace. And chapter 1 and 2 uh, have really focused in, the, the writer focuses in on who Jesus really is and begin teaching us uh, what's going to go all the way through the whole book, that Christ is superior. He is greater than, specifically in chapter 1 and 2, it's he's been greater than angels. And so today as we finish up chapter 2, he's going to resume his previous discussion about Jesus' superiority to angels. Now in chapter 1, he talked about Christ's divinity. Yes, Jesus is God, so he's more superior, he's superior to angels because God created the angels. Now this section is going to turn the page and look at the other side, kind of, and uh, see what, what the writer has to say about Jesus' humanity. Now, because the argument kind of went like this that he was trying to address is, okay, so I get that Jesus is God. Jesus created, uh, as God, he created the angels. I get that he's, he's superior to them in that respect. But Jesus became a man. And men are lower than angels. And what about that whole thing about him dying on the cross? Angels don't die. So how can he be greater than angels if he died? That's the whole thing that he's trying to address here. And so the writer of Hebrews helps us understand the answer to that question by giving us the reasons that Jesus became a man and why the incarnation was necessary. So we're going to jump right into this in verse 5 where we pick up from last time. Is the first, time, first reason that the incarnation is necessary is to restore order. That's what it says there in verse 5. 
for it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come. And so this verse emphasizes the fact that angels are powerful and glorious and, 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 and so powerful and glorious, but they were never meant to be rulers. <laughs> and so their rule, their role is not rulership. And we saw in the closing verse of chapter 1, and it told, he told us what their function is, and that is they were created to serve God and do His will, specifically in serving God's children, a.k.a. us believers in Jesus. And so to understand this section, we need to really go back and, and look at and remind ourselves of the original charge to Adam all the way back to the Garden of Eden. And if you look in verse 26 of Genesis chapter 1, God created Adam and Eve, and he told them to have dominion over fish, birds, heavens, livestock, and every other thing on earth. And so that was the original design. Humanity was given dominion, rulership, and administration. Now, sin interrupted that for a time, but one day that order will be restored, and that restoration process began at the cross. Now, do we see that yet? I mean, we're not with our eyes, but we are to, we'll hold on to the promise of a reconstructed order of things. We hold on to that by faith. So, you see, to us, the future is unknown. I mean, sometimes it seems dark and it seems scary and distressing because it seems like you just never know what's going to happen tomorrow, right? But that's not the way it is for God. He knows everything, and it's more than just simple awareness of the facts of what's going to happen. The future is not just something God knows, it is a place that God is. Now let's think about that for a minute, right? The future is not just something God knows, not just a list of facts out there, but it's a place where God is. So your future, anybody's future, all people's futures isn't just that list of facts. It's not a book he's pulling off the shelf to see what comes next. He exists there. And sometimes we say, sometimes we'll say, well, God is everywhere. And when we say it, we can kind of give the wrong impression. Like God is hopping all over the place, that he's here in Conyers, and he's out in the Bahamas, and he's over there in the Middle East, he's in China, and it seems like, well, he's moving around. But that's not the right way to say it. God is everywhere, but the better way to say it is that everywhere is in the presence of God. See, he is seated on a throne high and lifted up, and he does not move. He's not hopping around anywhere. All things are spread out before him. And that means everywhere in our present time, every location, and not just, just every location, but in every time, but all time is laid out in, before him. And from his perspective, you aren't just here in this moment, sitting in this room or watching this video online in this specific month and year. From God's perspective, he tells us in Romans 8.30 that you've been predestined, called, justified, and glorified. That is in past tense. From his perspective, you are already glorified. Ephesians 2, 6, he you, it says he's raised you up and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Also, past tense. So this is a done deal from God's perspective. So how can you say, okay, wait a minute, glorified? Um, I looked in the mirror this morning and I did not see glorified. <laughs> I mean, right? But from his, his perspective, it's already done. It is already done. He is not waiting around for some time to roll on a calendar somewhere where he does this for us. All time is laid out before him. It is all the same to him. We are the ones who are stuck in time, but he is not. He is above it. He is beyond it. He is over it. So the restoration of order of the creation that Hebrews is talking about here is also a done deal too. That's because the world to, to come from our perspective is already, already present to him now. All things made new. And with that comes the subjection of the world to come. So the writer goes on to give us a quote 
from this. And he says here, he says, it's been testified somewhere. Now, I got a chuckle out of that line when I was studying this is because, I mean, if you've ever forgotten where the location of a verse is, you are in good company because he's, he's basically saying here, um, somebody said this and I can't remember who it was. <laughs> I mean, that's come out of my mouth more than once, right? And so we uh, we know by uh, by all these years that that have passed that this is from Psalm eight, and it was David who wrote this. Now I want to look at this this quote here in context for a minute. So he, David starts in Psalm one. He says, "Oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth." Now some of you started singing the song in your head, right? <laughs> So this reminds us that psalms are not poetry, they are songs to be sung. So that's the way it would have been for them. So he says in verse 1, he gives glory to God. And you jump down to uh, verse 3, he says, When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place. So before we go on here, imagine kind of David out on the hillside. This is David is the shepherd, and he's looking up the sky on a moonless night. Now, remember, there's no light pollution where he was. Um, we didn't have to worry about any of that stuff from a city. But And if you've ever been out in uh, 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 on, a, on a mountain somewhere or away from cities and looked up and seen the Milky Way, it is amazing. It is an amazing. So I got on uh, Google and, and Googled some of this stuff just to get some pictures that don't do it justice. But this is the Milky Way here you know you can see millions of stars there and that's just the ones we can see with our with our eyes and then you start to see the color when you add a little bit of uh, uh, help with a the telescope then i got on the hubble telescope site and we start looking at the galaxies right these are amazing right and then another one also millions of stars and then <laughs> landed on this one this is the butterfly nebula, right? I mean, this is not with filters and stuff. This is just what it looks like. I mean, I was like, wow, wow, that is amazing how beautiful that is. And so when we look at things like this in compare, and start comparing ourselves to it, we're like, wow, wow. <laughs> and it's easy to start going, wow, that's so amazing, and here I am. And we start coming to the wrong conclusion. That is to start turning inward on ourselves and go, well, I'm not worth anything compared to all of that majesty and all that. I'm so small and so insignificant. Now, why does God even pay attention to me here on the earth? And that's kind of where David landed in Psalm 8. But the challenge is for us is not to turn inward on ourselves when we look at things like this, um, but start to look upward. That's what we need to do past all of these things and realize that they tell us something about God. And I mean, if you look through a telescope and imagine that if one day that the Hubble telescope people out there, they went, oh, we found the end of the universe. There's nothing beyond this. This is the end of the universe. What would that tell you about God? That he's finite, that he can be fully known. He's subject to our abilities. But looking and seeing this and the vastness and the endlessness points us to something different. I just read an article yesterday talking about the Milky Way, and, and they were saying in the article that it's like, we vastly under, underestimated how many stars are, are near us. It is, it is enormous. It's like 10 times what we thought it was. And I'm like, oh, yeah, right. <laughs> it's like, I'm not surprised. And so I could keep going on and on here, but John Piper says it better than I ever could. He said, the disparate portion between us and the universe is a parable about the disproportion between us and God. And it is an understatement. But the point is not to nullify us, but to glorify Him. Think about that. The more we look at what's around us, it doesn't even have to be the stars, it just can be the Grand Canyon or a beautiful mountain or the fall leaves outside the more it should cause us to stand in awe of God. And here's the quote, it's in Psalm 8, but this is what we got in Hebrews over there in chapter 2. He says, What is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lo lower than the heavenly beings or the angels and crowned him with glory and honor. 
So even though man was the crowning jewel of creation at the outset, he was kind of lower than angels in some respects because angels are heavenly creatures. They hang out in the throne room of God, right? And if God says, hey, go and uh, do this for me on the earth, they're dispatched and show up on earth. In that respect, uh, they're, they're greater than us. I mean, we're stuck here with our feet on the ground, and, but there is a time limit for this uh, disparity. The present chain of command is only temporary. God has destined for us, the destiny that God has for us is that he is going to elevate us to rulers, and we will be above the angels at that time. Now, how that's going to all work out, uh, we'll have to just wait till we get to, to, to eternity and see what that's about. But we, we are going to be rulers over these amazing creatures still vastly and overwhelmingly inferior to God, but return to that crowning jewel of creation that was intended from the beginning. And so at the end of Psalm 8, he talks about dominion here, and then he ends up by praising God again at the end, and he reflects kind of basically on what Hebrews said, that dominion belongs to humanity. That's what he says in verse 6 there. And then... Um, and when, what David did here is marvel at God's creation and then take ownership of the responsibility that he's been given. And so Psalm 8 looks back to creation in Genesis and also, even though he didn't have a revelation at the time, looks forward to the new creation that we have uh, explained to us in the book of Revelation. So back to Hebrews, uh, we get to verse 8. In 9, it says, uh, Now putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside of his control. So God put everything in the created order underneath Adam's, uh, sub, uh, in Adam's subjection, uh, uh, in subjection to Adam, and nothing was out of his control. Now that was before the fall. Now, then he goes on and says, At present, that means now, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. Now this, uh, so... <laughs> In the Garden of Eden, that was a long time ago, right? <laughs> a really long time ago. So we don't see the world in subjection to humanity right now, do we? I mean, just look at the destruction up in North Carolina and in Augusta after Hurricane Helene. The world is not in subjection to men, but it doesn't even have to really be that dramatic. I mean, have you ever had ants in your kitchen? <laughs> I mean, they are hard to get out. And you can stand there and say, leave my house, and they don't listen to you at all, <laughs> do they? I mean, the, the created order doesn't listen to us right now. And that's the world that we live in. So this he and this, don't get it confused here, that's still talking about Adam, but we get down to verse 9, the, we see him, that him is Christ, and he says, uh, sorry, uh, and he says, and that he for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, at that's where we know it's for sure he's talking about Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. So what he's doing here is contrasting the lost dominion of Adam with, uh, that's the first Adam, with the, the, with the work of the last Adam, that is Christ, and he's going to come and restore order that comes through his sacrifice and death is defeated once and for all. Then he goes, uh, the next thing that we see about why the uh, incarnation was necessary is to unify us with him, verse 10. And so what he says here is that it was fitting that he for whom by whom all things exist in bringing many sons to glory should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. Now we're going to talk about this way more in chapter 5, so I'm just going to touch on it for a minute. But basically what this is saying is that Christ is the source and founder of salvation, and his and for his work to be accomplished, he had to become fully man, and his work was perfected through suffering that he did on our behalf. Now don't get confused here. What was perfected was not Christ, because Christ himself is perfect, but because he became a man, he was revealed as our perfect leader and could understand us and therefore be unified with us through what he endured. So it's not Christ being perfected here. His, what he did for us, his suffering 
perfected what he did for us. Okay, then he goes on to say that he talks about sanctification now. He says, for he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are all one source. So here he talks about spiritual growth, basically. So we've got salvation, and now we're talking about spiritual growth, and sanctification is that part of us, that ongoing work of Christ, and it's a two-fold work that we see in this verse here. So first of all, he says that he sanctifies us. This is in the present tense. So uh, this is that ongoing work every day that you are con being conformed to the image of Christ. And we call this, this is some doctrine here, progressive sanctification. That's the ongoing work of Christ that leads us to growth and maturity. This is what happens every day when you yield and say no, when you fight temptation, when you pray, when you seek God, when you learn more about him, when you come to church, when you interact with other believers, this is the sanctifying work of God in your life. And it's worked out primarily through the presence of the Holy Spirit. And that is hopefully as you yield to his work in your life, you become more and more like Christ over time. That is, hopefully you can look back over your life and see two years, five years, ten years, you're not the same person you were anymore. That's the sanctifying work of God, ongoing sanctification. The second sanctification he mentioned here is the past tense sanctifica sanctification that in indicates a one-time completed action that is bestowed on you at the moment of salvation. It is enduring and it is eternal and can never be undone. And this is what we call positional sanctification. And I, the definition I got for it is the work of Christ that once and for all declares us righteous in God's eyes. That means no matter how much you falter and you fail, and in the ongoing growth part, that first sanctification, Positional sanctification is the declaration by God through the work of Christ that makes us righteous in his eyes. Okay? That means we stand before God cleared of all accusation. All guilt is gone. We are completely cleansed of all sin the moment we trust Christ as Savior and we are forever clothed in the righteousness of of Christ, and nothing soils that robe that we receive from him. So we have two types of sanctification here. And we're going to talk about that more later on as we get through the into the study, but that, that just touches on that right now. And then he says, part of the unification is, is in verse 11, this is why he's not ashamed to call them or us brothers. And this is an amazing truth here. I love this line right here. Now, we don't dwell on it that much as believers, but it is so, so important and so needed because it reminds us, you know what? Jesus is not ashamed of you. Jesus is not ashamed of you. If you know him as Christ as Savior, <laughs> he knows who you are. He knows what you have done. He knows what has been done to you. He knows what you have thought, what you have done in the dark recesses that nobody ever sees or know about. And guess what? He is not ashamed. I mean, so if you feel unworthy or less than, like you're a disappointment to God, stop it. This is your verse right here. Hold on to this. That is a lie from Satan to say that God's disappointed for, with you. It's not the truth, okay? Jesus identifies you voluntarily as his family. It's not that weird part of your family that is there, but nobody talks about, right? It's not those people. I mean, I saw, I saw this Braves game back in, I guess it was June or July, in the summer, and there was this kid there who was making his uh, MLB start as a pitcher, like 22 years old, just a kid. And they kept interviewing him and going up in the stands and talking to his family, his mom and dad and his aunt and uncle, and all these people were up there, and his, and his brothers and sisters who were younger than him, and they were beaming with excitement. 
I mean, they couldn't say, I mean, even the little kids, right? I mean, they were excited for their brother and they were interviewing him and all that. And they could not talk about how they were excited for their son and their relative and everything. And, and you know, he did really good in the first three innings. And then he got to the fourth and fifth inning and it went south. It went real bad, <laughs> really bad. But I'm telling you, it didn't matter what that kid did. This family was not ashamed of him. They were, he was not, they were not ashamed of him. I mean, they, they were happy and excited, even though it wasn't a perfect game. And this is Jesus toward you. This is the truth here. He is not ashamed. So underline this in your Bible and highlight it and hang on to it and stick it on a mirror and remind you. And when you feel less than, Jesus is not ashamed. So powerful. It can transform your life if you can just get hold of that one thing right there. And so then we get three Messianic quotes. Now, quotes, and I didn't realize that the little book you have in your hand does not have the references for the quotes in there. And I, why they wouldn't put those in there, I don't know. But it would be really good when you're studying by yourself or when you're in here to write these down so you can go back and look at them in context. And so here we have one from uh, Psalm 22. And if you were here in Mark, you know how important Psalm 22 is. And then we have two from Isaiah, and they just reiterate the same point. He's making a point that to remind us that our adoption into God's family is not a New Testament concept. It is the plan from all eternity. This was his plan that he was making you, grafting you in, bringing you in, and making you wholly accepted into his family. And then we go on, and verse 14 and 15 show us that the necessity of the incarnation is to free us from bondage. And so this is following up kind of on the previous point, saying that since his children are human, Jesus had to become human too to be our redeemer. And we get the reason for that in the that or so that. So it says here that he became flesh and blood and he partook of the same things that or so that through death, he might destroy the one who has the power of death. That is the devil. So look at what that says there, right? The devil has a very, very powerful weapon, and it is death, and it is threefold. Physical death, spiritual death, and eternal death. And so what the devil tries to do is keep you in that, that spiritual death that we're all born into until we cross physical death when eternal death becomes permanent. That's what he's trying to do. And death is a powerful weapon. And he wields it over to us in fear and intimidation and even th using things like distraction and, and forgetfulness, those kinds of things. He tries to use that to wield it over us. So now if you want to defeat somebody with a powerful weapon, what do you need? A more powerful weapon, right? I mean, you've heard the expression, right? Don't bring a knife to a gunfight. That's right. So the point of that is that you need to be properly equipped for the battle you're fighting. And the blood of Jesus is far more powerful than any weapon the devil has. And he defeated death once and for all. Now, the word power that used in that verse is kratos, which means uh, power in the sense of dominion. And he's having rule and authority. So the devil's dominion over the human race was in the form of death. That's what that verse is saying. But that dominion is now broken, which is what we see in Colossians 1.13. He, that is Jesus, has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son. And then we get verse 15. It says, And deliver all of those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. And I'm glad this piece is in here too. This, this back section of chapter 2 has a lot of really great stuff in it because here's the thing because I think it's possible and probably likely for a lot of believers to have freedom from death yet to live to their very last day in fear of it and so we've been freed by Jesus but the power that Satan wields over us through death is through fear of it and we don't get delivered from that because, and then we walk around being afraid to our very last day. Because, and now I don't know if you've ever uh, been have anxiety about something that was coming up, and 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 were you know just had a lot of anxiety about it. 
But if you have, what helps with that is talking to somebody who's been through it, right? Like, oh, yeah, you have a root canal coming up? I did that. I was better in two days. Or I had that knee replacement. I am pain-free now. Best thing I ever did. You know, that helps you, right? Or, hey, you're flying to England with your toddler. I went all the way to Australia, and I was fine. I mean, that just helps you, right? It's like to know somebody went through something and then survived on the other side of it, and then it makes it not scary anymore. And that's exactly what we have in Jesus, right? When it comes, death is scary. Death is dark, it's mysterious, and it's fueled by all kinds of misinformation and all this stuff from movies and everything. We're coming up on Halloween. I mean, look at all the stuff that talks about death, right? I mean, and we can be afraid of that. But as believers, we can let go of that anxiety and walk right by it uh, because we have a Savior who went through death and emerged on the other side in his glorious resurrection. And he says to us in John 14, 19, because I live, you also will live. That's a, that's a promise that we can hang on to and it has, should help deliver us from the fear of death. So we can walk in freedom and then we can do what God calls us to do, knowing that if the end of our days, which all of us face death, by the way, at once sometime, that we're not afraid of it that we're not shrinking back from it all the time, that we can trust God that he is going to deliver us through death to our own resurrection. And so uh, the last reason for the incarnation is to help us right now. This is verses 16 to 18. So this is bringing us all the way to the conclusion of his discussion about angels. And we're going to move on to something uh, else next time and not talk about angels anymore, but he reminds us that Jesus didn't go through all of this suffering for the for angels. He's not their advocate. What he's saying is that his work for us goes beyond bringing just eternal life to us right now or to out there in the future sometime when we die. He is our helper right this minute. And inter it's interesting here that he says in the back half of 16 there, is that he helps the offspring of Abraham. Now, <laughs> it doesn't say that he helps the offspring of Adam. Okay, now salvation is offered to the offspring of Adam. That is, Christ died for everybody, and everybody can take hold of that promise and that gift that he gives it if they want to. But Christ's help is not to the offspring of Adam. It's only available to the offspring of Abraham, who are the true sons and daughters of Abraham by Christ. That's exactly what it says in Galatians 3.29. If you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs to the promise. So when you have people say, well, you know, I pray to Jesus, I don't, I don't, I don't you know, or I pray to God, uh, he helps me, I don't go to church, not interested in the Bible, but I pray him helps me. It's not true. It's not true. His help is for his own family. And so the meaning of the word here for help back in, in, in Hebrews is to take hold of or to grasp and, he, and it's bring to deliverance. And so you can kind of think of it like drowning, right? So if you're going under one, two, three, you're down and somebody reaches down and pulls you up, that's what the picture is. And so it says here in Hebrews, he had to be made like his brother in every, brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest. We're going to talk about high priests coming up, so I'll hold that one. In service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Now that word propitiation is a good Bible word. Uh, it's probably not in a modern translation anywhere, but we should know what it means. And propitiation just means turning of God's wrath away from us. And God's wrath towards sin is real. It says in Ephesians that we're under the wrath of God until we become saved, but it just means that what Jesus did turns away God's wrath towards sin away from us. And that Christ's sacrifice took away that wrath for those who believe. And verse 17 here is like an exclamation mark on the whole argument from chapter 1 and 2, that Christ came exactly like humanity in his our, our incarnation to atone for our sin, to serve as our high priest, and but through his work, he grabbed us from the drowning in the floodwaters of sin 
and pulled us up. And then it says here in the last verse here, for because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are also being tempted. And sometimes I think when we talk about the temptation of Christ, we go, yeah, was it really that real? I mean, he's God, right? <laughs> I mean, I, it, 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 how, would, how tempting is material things in the world be to God when you own the cattle on a thousand hills, right? I mean, or how much would you want the accolades of a bunch of fickle people if you've heard the angelic voices of praise from the beginning, foundation of the world, right? I mean, it's like, okay. <laughs> but that word there that means pierced through. That what he suffered, the temptation he suffered, means pierced through, enticed to do evil. And so all the things that you and I are, are tempted with came at Jesus too. Full strength, yet without sin. Talk about that more in chapter 4 too, but the point here is that because what he experienced and what he, him becoming human, he experienced all these things. He's our example. And he's the one who looks at us with compassion and intervention when we falter and our fail and he hears us cry. And uh, so to wrap up this whole point about angels, they can never fulfill this role because they've never experienced suffering and temptation the way Christ did and the way we do. And for us, they have never experienced the grace and mercy of God either. So we started really, really big in this section, talking about the stars and the sky and the universe and all of that. And, uh, and, and we were wondering about, does God really care about me here, this small person here on earth? And here at the end, we're, the reminder is yes. Yes, he cares for you. Yes, he creates and names stars and does all this great, amazing creation and sustains it and holds it together. And, but he is also intimately concerned about you. Every number, every hair on your head number, every sparrow that falls, he knows. He is concerned about what concerns you. Bring it to him. Whatever it is, he wants to hear. And so he showed us mainly this by becoming like us and subjecting himself to the same things we feel, same temptations we have. And so how does he respond when we come to him? He listens attentively and he hears and responds to our cries for help. So all that we see here on earth, it's all going away one day. God, God is going to remake it, burn it with fire, and he's going to remake it one day. Hallelujah, right? <laughs> I mean, he, he has a plan for the earth, but he has a much greater plan for each one of us. And so if we cry out to him, choose to follow him closely, yield to his will, will we can be sure that no matter what happens, just like it says in Jude, he is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Amen? God, we just thank you that uh, you became a man and that you know what we, what we experience, you sympathize with us, and you are able to help and to be our help. God, thank you for all you did and uh, that it just didn't stop with saving us, but that you went on and on and on and on to walk beside us, to encourage us, to live us in us through the presence of the Holy Spirit. God, give us a heart to follow you, to look at all you've made and know that we can trust you and believe you and know that you are not ashamed. We pray in the powerful name of the Son of God. Amen.